All right, let's go ahead and get started, guys. Hopefully, everyone's here for the <clears throat> uh, Crypto Locker deep dive. Uh, let's go ahead and hand off to uh, Nicholas and Olivia. So this is actually Olivia's first time at ShmooCon, and I'm super excited for her. Wish me luck. <laughs> Don't screw it up! <laughs> so today we're going to talk about uh, a tool that we, we worked on together called uh, White Rabbit, which basically helps you to track adverse adversaries on the Bitcoin public ledger. I know we, t we said that we're going to talk about CryptoLocker, but also there was another campaign that we added uh, related to the Riot ransomware campaign, which has been wrapping up since August. But let me first start with an overview of crypto crime or cybersecurity crime that leverage cryptocurrencies. There are three main types of uh, threats observed. The first one, which is the most uh, severe, are ransomware attacks. I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the, the impact of these types of attacks. Ransomwares have been uh, seen for a while, but they've been leveraging cryptocurrencies since around 2013. They slowed down around 2016, 2017, but in 2018, they came back, and actually there was a study that mentioned that there was a 200% increase compared to 2017 in 2018. Um, ransomware also, according to a study by Europol, uh, is the main uh, type of malware attacks. The other type of attacks are extortion attacks, and they also leverage cryptocurrency, particularly Bitcoin. Extortion are uh, usually delivered through emails or mail. And basically what happens is they, they, the attackers tell the victim that they have damning or shaming pictures about the victim and they blackmail, blackmail them to pay a ransom uh, for them not to deliver these pictures about the victims. Uh, they're not as uh, big of a threat as ransomware, but still we're seeing them out there in the wild. The third type of, of malicious activities are crypto jacking type of, of attacks. They're not necessarily malicious, but they can eat up resources on servers. So basically what happens is that actors install mining software to mine certain cryptocurrencies. It's, it, it, it doesn't happen for Bitcoin because the tools required for Bitcoin to be mined are very specialized. So usually the type of cryptocurrencies that are mined are Ethereum or, or Monero. In this talk, we will mainly focus on, on Bitcoin as, and, and its public ledger for many reasons. It still is, according to studies, the main cryptocurrency leverage in, in, in attacks. Um, actually, in the past few months, like as I said before, Ryuk has been uh, ramping up as a ransomware. And it's, it's a very sophisticated attack compared to previous ransomware attack as it, as it leverages different types of, of tactics and techniques to enter into the uh, victim's servers. Uh, so one of the, the, the way Ryuk is delivered is through Emotet. So there's an Emotet C2 sitting out there, which is leveraged to deliver TrickBot first and then Riot. So the reason is why they deliver all these types of malware is because they want to monitor the server that they hacked into. They monitor it to determine if there's like something very valuable within this server. If there is something valuable or if this server is attributed to a specific high-profile orga organization, then they start encrypting the data set. And we will see later on when we monitor what is happening within the Bitcoin addresses associated to Riot that the amounts of payments that was delivered to these uh, bad actors was substantially larger than previous, previous ransomware attacks. So in a nutshell, ransomware has been evolving for a while. And, the, and ransomware hackers have been, um, if you want, they, they always uh, are looking for new technologies to improve uh, their attacks. And one of these technologies was their, the payment methodology. They were the, one of the uh, few, if you want, 
technologists that adopted uh, cryptocurrency as a type of payments. And there's many reasons for that. The main reason, particularly for Bitcoin, is that it has two specific characteristics that were attractive for them. The first characteristic of Bitcoin is that it's decentralized. Decentralized in the sense that there's no central authority that can stop a payment. So basically, you can receive a payment from anywhere in the world, from any other place in the world, and no one can, can stop them. Um, the second um, type of characteristic that is useful is that it's pseudo-anonymous, in the sense that you don't really know who transacted, but you know that someone transacted. But there's no attribution to a specific identity. The, there are two other characteristics that are more useful to defenders. The uh, these are the immutability of the Bitcoin public ledger. By immutability, we mean that the data, once it's stored on the public ledger, it's very hard or super expensive to change the data persisted on the Bitcoin public ledger. Even nation state actors probably tried to change what was persisted on the blockchain and they, they, they didn't succeed because it's so expensive. The second the characteristic that is useful for defenders is that it's a public ledger, so anyone from any place in the world can spin up a Bitcoin node and start traveling uh, the, the, the data and try, and try to analyze it for research purposes. Uh, so both it's good for investigation as well as for scientists and researchers to understand um, the transaction. Before we go to, uh, into the explanation of what is the, 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 the workflow we followed or the, the tool that we developed, I want to go over a little bit um, the Bitcoin data model, as well as the, CT, uh, the cyber threat intelligence data model, in the sense uh, uh, I want to showcase how Bitcoin addresses can be helpful in a, in a cyber threat intelligence context. But also before that, I want to go over how you can think about the Bitcoin data model. There's two main abstractions within the Bitcoin data model, the blocks and the transactions. Blocks are mined by miners, and they basically have properties such as the block height. Block height can be directly mapped to a specific time, and every 10 minutes, a block is mined by a miner. Once it's mined, a coin base is generated, and that coin base is basically the reward that is delivered to the miner. So as I said, uh, a block contains transactions. And transaction basically has information about the amount of Bitcoin that were transferred from a specific Bitcoin address to another Bitcoin addresses. And transactions have inputs and outputs. Inputs as you are usually associated to the sender's Bitcoin address. So basically the sender that is sending Bitcoin. And the outputs of the transaction are associated to the Bitcoin that are delivered to a recipient's wallet. A sender can be both a recipient and a sender in the sense that there's always change that is recovered uh, after a transaction, during a transaction, back to the recipients. From a CTI perspective, uh, uh, by the way, this is a, a graph representation of how the Bitcoin uh, data can be parsed out into a graph database. And the developers at Neo4j basically leverage that data model and you can leverage their tool to, to populate that specific data model. The second data model is, a, is the CTI data model where you can leverage a Bitcoin uh, address to basically um, indicate, so from a sticks model type of context, you can leverage a Bitcoin address and say that that Bitcoin address can indicate a specific threat or adversary. And so it can indicate something like an attack pattern, something like a malware or something like a campaign, etc. In the context of the Riot ransomware, which was actually the, the result of that investigation was open sourced on January 10th by a, a bunch of researchers, particularly from CrowdStrike. And basically, they were able to attribute that specific campaign, the Riot campaign, to a specific threat actor out of Russia. Uh, and also, you can basically leverage whatever that was written in these researchers' documents to basically say that a specific Bitcoin address directly, if you see it, can indicate that is um, associated to the ransomware itself, Riot, but also you can leverage it for attribution if you believe in, in, in the attribution. And now I'll give it to Olivia to dig deeper into the type, the tool that we use to basically track these events on the public ledger. 
Um, so we've been talking a lot about um, how we're able to use Bitcoin um, as, a, as, a, as a form of uh, determining the activity of these bad actors. Um, from the research and the tool that we worked on, we kind of extended that to this idea that Bitcoin balances um, can actually be monitor monitored to be predictors of uh, ransomware campaigns ramping back up. Um, and we're actually going to go into the process for um, how this tool is used and built um, in the next few slides. Um, so here we have the three-step workflow, um, and the first step on the left side is what we call harvest seeds. Um, so what we've what um, is happening here is um, we from a variety of sources um, that have um, published victims is. Um, uh, published Bitcoin addresses that victims have paid ransom to. Um, we were able to uh, find a couple of Bitcoin addresses um, for a couple of different ransomware campaigns. Um, and so these Bitcoin addresses that um, the victims paid ransom to are what are called seeds. And I'll get into that a little bit more in the next slide. Um, but just having these seeds alone is kind of like ha like looking for a needle in a haystack. It's just one piece of information, and it doesn't actually provide um, much intelligence to the investigation. Um, so that's where we um, use these seeds, um, these seed Bitcoin addresses, to actually um, build out um, uh, clusters of Bitcoin addresses. And um, there are a couple heuristics that I'm going to go through that um, are good options for how to build these clusters. Um, but essentially what the objective is of building these clusters is to um, create a, an, an, a, to approximate um, a bad actor's wallet, um, which are the addresses that they control. And from there, we monitor these wallets um, in order to see what was the actual financial impact, um, where did the money go, um, and to relate it back to other um, indicators um, that are in the threat ecosystem. Um, so going back to the seed Bitcoin addresses that I was talking about, um, on the top left corner is a screenshot of a uh, pop-up from uh, CryptoLocker. And here, it's pretty much just the ransom note um, telling victims that their machine has been infected and, um, if, and their files have been encrypted. Um, and if they would like their, uh, to receive a private key to decrypt their files, they would have to pay um, some specified amount um, to that specified Bitcoin address um, within uh, a specified amount of time, so say 72 to 100 hours. Um, and if they don't pay within uh, that time limit, uh, they would actually um, increase the price of the ransom. Um, so this Bitcoin address that we see in that pop-up is what we actually um, call the seed. And so it was, it's, um, the, we define it as the Bitcoin address that the attacker demands payment to or else the victim's data may stay encrypted or destroyed. Um, and we were able to find them through a number of sources that we have um, on the top right. Um, so in, the, pre in uh, the previous slide, I was also talking a bit about a wallet and a bad actor's wallet. So um, we can kind of think of a wallet as a set of Bitcoin addresses controlled by an entity. And how it actually works is that there's a software program that um, stores all the private keys for the Bitcoin address that a user controls. Um, and um, for our purposes, uh, we think of an attacker's wallet as being um, one or more wallets. Um, and the, the challenge that we actually face in, uh, is, is finding these wallets. So there's actually no um, way in Bitcoin protocol to uh, find these wallets, but there's a couple of heuristics that um, can give us uh, some level of approximation. So um, 
The few that I wanted to go over were um, these five. And um, the first is what's called co-spending. And um, in Bitcoin protocol, what's allowed is for multiple uh, Bitcoin addresses to be used as inputs in the same transaction. And so one heuristic is looking um, for all Bitcoin addresses that were involved in that same transaction. Um, and the second is um, what's called uh, change address. So um, every time there is a transaction with two or more outputs, um, there is a unique change address that is used um, uh, in that transaction um, that is assumed the, um, that, that, uh, that user who is putting in those two inputs also owns. Um, and the third one, the optimal change address, uh, also builds upon that heuristic where um, it would, well, under the assumption that um, wallet software doesn't spend any unnecessary outputs, um, it's unlikely that the change value would be greater than any of the spent outputs. Um, and the fourth is uh, no change. So in the case where one address sends all of its balance to another address, um, and the final one is um, about consumer wallets. So a consumer wallet is um, understood as a wallet that by default only sends, uh, only allows you to send Bitcoins to a single address. Um, in that case, um, you can only create transactions with two outputs. Um, so for our actual tool, we decided to focus um, on the co-spending heuristic. And uh, the reason for that is um, it was by far the most effective, and research has shown that um, by going off of one Bitcoin address, so in our case, the seeds, um, it we were able to use that to reveal up to 69% of the wallet. Um, so this, this slide uh, kind of tries to visualize what that heuristic actually looks like. Um, so here you can see on the left side are the victims who have received this um, ransomware note and they are being asked to pay um, some sp specified amount anywhere between 0.3 or 2 Bitcoin addresses in the case of CryptoLocker um, and they're paying it to uh, one of the seed Bitcoin addresses that was find found in the note. Um, so from there what uh, the bad actors who receive this ransom can do is to quickly move uh, the money in a way that it is hard to actually track, and um, in a in a way, uh, a s like moving it from uh, th their that original Bitcoin address to other addresses in their wallet. Um, and so we recursively look for other Bitcoin addresses that share that were an input in that shared transaction. Um, right now, we're actually going to go into um, the setup for the tool in case any of you are interested in setting this up locally. Um, so, uh -oh. Where is it? Here? No, no. Where is it? Sorry about this. Oh, because it's on this. Uh oh. Okay. It's on the other screen. Yeah, it's okay. Uh oh. Uh, now it's on the other one. So, ladies and gentlemen, what you're seeing is the dark god of demos. <laughs> Actually, oh no, <laughs> sorry, technical difficulties. Uh, this uh, remove from, uh, get out of the, because uh, I'm on. Cool. Okay. Um, so we have a link um, on one of the slides, but um, this is our repository where we built the tool and also stored sorry, some. Oh, sorry. 
Um, so this is the repository where we've actually uh, have the code for the tool and some setup instructions as well as some Bitcoin address seeds and um, some of the balances um, that we were able to uh, compute using this clustering heuristic. So if I go down, um, you can see that here are a couple of the setup instructions. Um, they're pretty straightforward to follow. Basically, we recommend setting up a virtual environment and downloading some of the requirements. Um, to, uh, and below, we have some references to um, BlockSci, which is a really powerful um, open source tool that we use to explore the blockchain. Um, it, it, it comes with a couple of clustering heuristics um, and extra extra tools like tags in order for you to be able to traverse the blockchain and um, build these clusters around ad addresses given, I think, about five or so heuristics and um, to then be able to store them. Um, So we're actually going to look at the Python notebook that we used um, for a second, um, specifically for CryptoLocker. Um, you can take a look at this um, at home or later on, but uh, we just wanted to go through um, a little bit of what the sequence of operations are. And the first thing that happens um, is we uh, instantiate this blockchain object, which um, is what we then use to, which is, which is parsed blockchain data that we then use to um, build these clusters. Um, to define the clustering heuristic that is actually used, um, we have to cancel out one of the heuristics that they have provided, which is the change heuristic. So it, the syntax is basically just to subtract the change heuristic from itself. And that's how we end up with the no change heuristic, which is a which is how you are actually able to um, apply the co-spend heuristic on BlockSci. Um, and once we do that, we build a cluster manager that we can pass this heuristic into. And then um, here, are some, here are two um, Bitcoin address seeds from CryptoLocker that we then fed into um, this cluster manager. Um, and a couple of the functions below are mostly just like helpers in order to transform the results into something uh, more easier to visualize. So the results will come back um, giving uh, the block height, which is essentially the timestamp, um, and the, big, the balances in Bitcoin. So these are mostly just to convert them to US dollars at the time and um, the actual uh, human readable time. Okay, sorry about that. Thanks for your patience. Um, so this is where we're actually going to go a little bit more into our deep dive of CryptoLocker given our tool and research. Um, so we wanted to cover a little, for those of you who may not know, we're just going to cover a little bit about what CryptoLocker um, was and some of the, uh, some of the var variants that arose afterward. Um, so CryptoLocker was a ransomware attack that dated bet between September 2013 and May 2014. Um, so what was happening was uh, tens of millions of, of machines running Windows, um, Microsoft Windows in the UK and other uh, English-speaking countries um, 
were being targets for emails that were imitating um, FedEx and UPS tracking notices. So what seemed to be really um, benign emails were actually um, emails that had zip files attached to them um, that contained an executable. Um, and so this was propagated through um, the Zeus Trojan and botnet. And essentially what happened was um, the, the user would see that all of their files um, were being encrypted um, by, uh, a, by, an, by an encryption key that was uh, Create, that was generated by the CNC server um, that would send that would create a that would create a pair a key pair and send the public key back to the infected machine, which would then encrypt um, all the files in their local hard drives and um, log each file on a registry key. Um, so, in order for the user to for the victim to then receive that uh, private key to actually decrypt their files, um, they would have to pay anywhere between 2 bit, 0.3 Bitcoin to 2 Bitcoin. Um, it actually started at 2 Bitcoin and was lowered um, over time. And they would have to pay that within 72 hours in either prepaid cash voucher like MoneyPack or Ucash um, or in Bitcoin. Um, so this is just a overall timeline of CryptoLocker, as you see on the bottom left, highlighted in yellow, and um, a couple of the clones or variants that came out of it. Um, so we're going to go through each of them individually and kind of what the, what the clusters um, were formed using our tool for each of them. Um, so with CryptoLocker, um, which was, which we're referring to as the original, um, it was actually super successful, um, making up somewhere around 25 to 30 million dollars um, over its run. And this was one cluster that we were able to generate using four seeds um, that were found. Um, what's interesting is before any of this clustering was performed um, by researchers before us. Um, there were all sorts of estimates on how much of a financial impact it had, how many victims actually paid the ransom, and the numbers really varied where um, I believe Dell had an estimate of 0.3% of victims paid the ransom. Um, Symantec believed that uh, 4% paid the, uh, I think 4% paid the ransom, and that, um, and the University of Kent, based on a survey, was able to determine that 41% actually paid the ransom. So the numbers were all over the place. And using um, clustering heuristics, they were able to determine that actually 1.3% of victims paid the ransom. Um, so this is the first clone that came out from CryptoLocker. And it actually used the same kind of marketing material or the same uh, kind of, it had the same name, the same ransom note. Um, and there wasn't much different between the actual crypto locker and this clone. Um, and what's interesting is it's believed to be, have been made by the crypto wall group um, uh, between November 2013 and January 2014. Um, but what comes next is a whole slew of crypto wall, uh, the crypto wall group making um, other kinds of ransomware uh, campaigns. And the first that we have here is crypto defense, which um, we were using a few seeds. We were able to come up with two clusters. Um, and crypto defense um, goes from, goes, dates back as early as February 2014, but only lasted a month. And that could, prop, that could be possibly explained by um, a huge cryptographic flaw that was found in the implementation. So this was published um, by a security firm and widely um, distributed to victims. So that could explain the short run that it had and, the, and that the financial impact, while it was sizable, was not anything in comparison to CryptoLocker before it. Um, so this is an overview of all of the four versions of CryptoWall that we found um, through our clustering heuristics. Um, I'm going to go through each of them individually, um, but 
you can see that there are actually a large number of clusters that were found for each of the seeds um, that we had. In the first version of CryptoWall, um, we were able to find six clusters. Um, and it in total made about $720,000. Um, and what you can kind of see here is they have definitely um, improved upon their previous uh, cryptographic flaw. Um, and the reason for why it did not make as much money as, well, one of the reasons why it may not have made as much money as, crypto, as the initial crypto locker and why it had a, still a shorter run than the, than the original is because there was a flaw in the removal of the original files. Um, where when a file was encrypted, the original file was still um, saved, and it would be uh, the Windows all delete uh, tool wasn't actually functioning perfectly, so um, if there was enough slack space on disk, it was possible to recover those files. So I'm gonna go through the rest of the versions pretty quickly. Um, so CryptoWall 2, um, there weren't a lot of changes um, between CryptoWall 2 and 3, except that they started experimenting with um, their uh, network communication. Um, they started using Tor, but then uh, kind of gave up on that because of how easy it was to uh, observe um, the actual network traffic. Um, and Compared to the other compared to the other versions, CryptoWall 2 also didn't really make that much money. We were actually only able to find one cluster for it. Um, but it is interesting to note that each of the clusters or each of the wallets that we found do map to a specific version of CryptoWall, and it shows that they are using new Bitcoin addresses. They are creating new wallets, but that there are ways using um, other indicators to put to link these different clusters to a single campaign and actually get a bigger scope of the attack and that while crypto wall 2 may just be this short time span on a graph with a large uh, input of Bitcoin and a quick um, output within a month um, there's actually a lot more to this picture um, so crypto wall version 3 um, this one actually made a huge amount of money compared to the others it made over two million dollars and um, we were able to find several clusters on here um, so crypto wall 3 um, started in early 2015 and one of the improvements of it was that they started using AES AES instead of RSA, and that enabled them to have a shorter uh, encryption time for larger amounts of files. Um, they also changed um, to, they also moved to the I2P network, and they were able to, um, with this new encryption, um, in add more file extensions that they could then also encrypt. Um, while this was super successful, they did abandon it um, for CryptoWall 4. There's no clear reason why they may have done that, um, but we, were, uh, we weren't actually able to um, find much about CryptoWall version 4. We did find a few clusters, um, but there is not much. It made a very small amount of money compared to the other versions. Um, and this is where we go into another ransomware campaign that has um, popped up more recently to kind of give you an opportunity to contrast um, CryptoLocker to Riot. So as Olivia said, like our methodology can be helpful to reconstruct the Bitcoin wallets of the attackers. For this particular ransomware, it has come to our like attention that the attackers were much more efficient in changing the, the, the wallets they were using uh, for their attacks. So in the crypto wall, for each version, you, you were able to reconstruct a smaller amount of cluster, whereas for, um, for, for Ryak, uh, the number of clusters was pretty large. So for, th for 38 seeds, we were able to reconstruct 28 um, clusters, on, uh, 20 clusters only. So which tells you that these guys know what they're doing and they're basically efficient at changing their wallets before delivering the Riot ransomware. There's many uh, research out there to study her, uh, Riot, and some of them uh, say that Riot could be a clone of Hermes because it shares a lot of code with Hermes. Hermes was initially attributed to North Korean actors, 
but uh, a recent study from January by, by CrowdStrike uh, believes that Ryag is uh, coming out of a threat actor uh, within Russia. One other interesting thing, when you look at uh, the data that is coming from the Bitcoin public ledger, is there's usually the payments delivered to uh, ransomware attackers were pretty small. Whereas for Ryak, because as we said at the beginning, they're waiting to be, uh, to, they, they, they wait to determine if the server that they hacked into is a high profile target. If it is a high profile target, they start encrypting and they ask for a lot of money. And if you look at the, the, the data, sometimes the balance or the payments received were as high as $400,000 uh, to these attackers. And we were able to compute some of the stats uh, related to these payments. Uh, and as I said, there were 20 clusters that were formed out of 38 Bitcoin addresses. So it's a pretty uh, large number of clusters compared to the number of seeds. Uh, which tells you that, as I said, they were efficient in changing uh, their wallets so that you, they hide the attribution. Uh, but also, uh, the number of payments was pretty low uh, in the sense that, as I said, they were targeting high profile uh, targets. Uh, so that's why the number of payments was low, but the mean payment for e uh, the mean payment out of, out of the 62 payments was around $130,000. Uh, and the estimated revenues was around, using our methodology, was around 1,600 bitcoins, which maps, uh, if you convert it using the price at each time, uh, to dollar, to around $7.8 million. It's a number that, if you read the CrowdStrike report, it's a number that is around two times higher than what CrowdStrike estimated. Uh, but I think uh, CrowdStrike did not use that specific clustering methodology that tries to approximate uh, the bitcoin wallet. Um, th at the end of the day, it's all estimates. Uh, it would be interesting to compare notes on these estimations. In conclusion, I want to link it back to uh, a little bit into CTI in the sense that like, we would like, we propose to update the pyramid of pain in the sense of adding Bitcoin addresses as some form of indicator uh, to indicate cer certain types, uh, certain uh, adversaries or attacks. And what is interesting about Bitcoin is that it has um, a combination of characteristics. The, some of these characteristics makes it look like a hash in the sense that it's very, very useful to link events to each other, uh, but it's kind of short-lived. Like if the attacker is really good at changing their Bitcoin wallets, then the seeds become uh, obsolete after a couple of days or weeks. Uh, but at, while at the same time, it has some uh, form of like, char like a TTP characteristic in the sense that if uh, you're an exchange, you're able to, if you know that this cluster is associated to a bad wallet, which is associated to uh, an attacker, you'll be able to discriminate against their payment. You'll be able to stop them and disrupt their payments. Or like even like, you know, stop their payment infrastructure, make it obsolete. But this, all of this comes with a, with a caveat. Like, as a final thought, I want us to also like, pause a minute and think a little bit about uh, the, the problems of this methodology. There's a couple of problems. And the first one that I want to point out is the problem of missing seeds. So if you don't have the, the intelligence of knowing that that specific Bitcoin address was associated to ransomware, you might miss out some clusters uh, that are associated to the attacker. So it's not, a, if you want, it's not an exhaustive methodology. It relies on intelligence. One possible solution is to try to integrate uh, malware sandbox to Blockchain Explorer directly in real time. So once you have the intelligence, you're directly able to perform the clustering and start monitoring. That's potentially one possible solution. Uh, there's also missing labeled data, right? Like there's a lot of uh, activity on the blockchain that can mirror what the bad actors are doing. So if you, if you, do, if, if you know a little bit of machine learning or, and you want to leverage some form of un unsupervised technique and you don't have la labeled data, uh, some of the activity on the blockchain that is performed by people that care about privacy uh, could mimic the, 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 the profile of a malicious actor. Um, so, an unsupervised type of clustering technique comes with caveats in the sense that you don't want to discriminate against potentially 
privacy seeking um, actors. So which brings us to the mind, the, to my last point is that there is a problem of ethics and privacy when you build up this tool, because these tools can be used to do a surveillance or uh, on, on the blockchain. You can use them as surveillance. And uh, basically you have to be careful not to discriminate against privacy seeking uh, uh, people that are not bad, uh, just because they, they have an activity profile that is similar to the bad actor. Uh, and one potential solution is to be proactive in sharing uh, seeds with, um, with each other. Uh, sharing seeds would allow you to reconstruct cluster as fast as possible. And also, as I said before, building that uh, integration between a sandbox and blockchain uh, explorer tools could be super useful to connect intelligence with the blockchain directly and ha not have to rely on unsupervised type of techniques. Yeah, as a, f as a final note, our, our code is available on our GitHub repository. There's also the live tool that is on the website. Uh, it's called White Rabbit. We also ro wrote an exhaustive blog about uh, the crypto locker. I'd like to also publish something about Ryak soon, uh, but th this goes into a deep dive also about uh, how we perform the methodology for CryptoLocker to track uh, the payments that were uh, uh, delivered to, to the attackers. Um, opening up for questions. Oh, I, uh, have you seen any instances of like, crypto attack programs, crypto block or whatever, that generate a new Bitcoin address for every infection? Yeah, so uh, the, the more, uh, I, I would assume that, that uh, if the attacker is more sophisticated, mm -hmm. they usually make it a point to, to change dynamically for every new uh, infection, they would generate a new Bitcoin address, mm -hmm. which links it to like, they increase their privacy by generating a Bitcoin addresses every time. Right. And, and it helps. And if they know that you're correlating events based on Bitcoin address, mm -hmm. then that m generating a new seed would make it hard to... Make it very hard to track. To, really, to, ha to track, yeah. Okay, so that's what I yeah. thought was good. Um, just, to add on, just to add on to that, um, I think in the case of WannaCry, they only used um, a one seed Bitcoin address, which made it really difficult to actually know who, uh, which victims paid. So that might be another reason why they would do that. Uh, sort of related question. Um, have you seen much evidence of coin join um, as a, uh, because the correlation of inputs is, uh, gets, gets pretty messy with that? And I'm wondering if, like, as they get more sophisticated, that becomes more of a concern for you? So you're talking about mixers? Yeah. Uh, yeah, like, like, like uh, yeah, basically. Uh, so, yeah, we definitely saw some of this. Uh, so basically, the code blows up when like you hit a coin join, yeah. so you know oh, we hit yeah. like a it's dead like all end. Of a it's a billion dollars. Yeah, <laughs> like it either like builds up like a bunch of uh, millions of Bitcoin addresses, or like yeah, it, it doesn't uh, execute. Um, so we there's no there are good ways. I think Blockside has a way to like crack coin join, um, but it's very like it, uh, it's not a like it's complex. It has high complexity. Yeah. It doesn't scale. Uh, you so haven't still, seen it in, in the wild here or anything like that? Um, yeah, I think I've seen it for a couple of seeds. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've seen it definitely. But also it could be, uh, I haven't investigated fully if, if like um, we've hit like a, an exchange mm -hmm. or it was an actual coin join transaction, uh, if that makes sense. Because sometimes you hit a, a wallet that is part of an exchange and yeah. then, then like you uh, build a cluster that has like uh, millions of <laughs> Bitcoin addresses, which is probably associated to an exchange, and like, yeah. yeah, there's no way, at least that I know of, to like figure out which one is associated to the actor, which also links it to like, if you follow unsupervised technique to see like, oh, like this is the profile they follow uh, of like transaction. This is like maybe after two days they uh, um, they uh, uh, um, like maybe after two days they retrieve all of their money. Mm -hmm. uh, that if, if that is an indicator for you that this is associated to that specific actor, mm -hmm. then 
uh, you can think of the, all the false, false positive you could generate and you could flag like some, just any person on the blockchain basically. I see. Yeah. Cool. Any Thank legitimate you. person, yeah. Okay, so two things. One's a question from the stream and one's a comment from me. Uh, whether CoinJoin or an exchange or any mixer, uh, it, I, I would recommend you throw a threshold in there. You yeah. said you get a million. Yeah. At that point, just let that one as a dead end because anybody putting into CoinJoin isn't necessarily a bad actor. They're just an idiot. Right. So, um, because no mixer is actually anonymous. You right. put in, you get out. It's like right. dog. Right. So, uh, second, if it goes to an exchange, that's a whole different story. These are right. not malicious bad actors. Right. It's not a cluster of bad actors. Right. It's just a cluster of people putting into an exchange. Correct. That's the comment from me. Correct. Second, a uh, question from the stream. Can you elaborate on how you use Bitcoin addresses in threat intelligence investigations? Which I think is your blog post. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and the most easy way to use it in investigation is to correlate events. Uh, that's the easiest way, right? Uh, and then for, uh, for the public ledger data, uh, the transaction data, you can use it to know if like, there is activity associated to that Bitcoin address. Uh, and you can get a sense also of the severity of the ransomware itself. Like that's, I think, valuable from a threat intelligence context. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you.